San Diego experts continue to work on a treatment for Zika, the high-tech research crossing international borders and how it needs your help. We have uh, found that people are locking themselves into the restrooms here on the pier. Overflowing onto the Oceanside Pier, one stinky situation. The challenge for city leaders and people who need a warm place to sleep. They're virtually the perfect invader. The Zama Newt, on the other hand, is an ideal prey. A tiny creature had crawled to the top of the food chain until now. The changes in climate that helped the perfect invader take over. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan Murphy. Human error or an act of terror. These are two theories being considered in the investigation of a passenger plane that disappeared on its way to Egypt. The United States will join an international research team. Authorities lost track of Egypt Air Flight 804 during a flight from Paris to Cairo early this morning. They say the plane swerved wildly before it crashed into the Mediterranean Sea. Victims' families flew to Cairo on another Egypt airplane to wait for news of their loved ones. 66 people were on board, including two babies and a child. Egyptian and Russian officials say the plane may have been brought down by terrorists. Airport officials say security has been heightened at Los Angeles International and other airfields in response to Egypt air flight. However, there were no immediate security changes at San Diego International. A spokeswoman at Lindbergh Field says they have not received instructions from TSA to change current measures. Passengers say they are willing to wait through longer security lines for the sake of safer flights. I think we need more security and more protection, yes. Even it if it needs it, longer lines? Yes. You can never be too cautious. Um, so if that's what it takes to wait a little bit longer, you know, to make sure that everybody's having a safe travel, then let's wait. We'll continue to follow this story on air at KPBS Radio and online at kpbs.org. A coalition aiming to improve the state's infrastructure rallied at California's capital today. The coalition pushed for a plan that calls for spending nearly $6 billion over five years on projects meant to fix the state's dilapidated highways. They want lawmakers to use funds from the state budget. They also called for a 12-cent gas tax, which would be phased in over three years. You can call it a lifeline for California's high-speed rail project. Federal transportation authorities gave the green light on a grant that would cover more than $2 billion in matching funds. The high-speed rail authorities approved a new business plan last month. It calls for trains to run between the Central Valley and San Jose starting in 2025. The Hillary Clinton campaign says former President Bill Clinton will appear at a rally in Chula Vista on Saturday to campaign for his wife Hillary. It will be held at Benita Vista High School starting at 10.30 in the morning. That same night, Democratic candidate Bernie Sanders is scheduled to appear in National City. And on Sunday, Sanders is set to speak in Vista. Students in San Diego and Tijuana lead increasingly binational lives. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero explains how this may affect the future workforce on the border. The Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at UC San Diego surveyed more than 6,000 Tijuana and San Diego students in the 9th and 10th grades. It's the largest sample of students surveyed to date in the cross-border region. Researchers say one in every four of students surveyed consider themselves to be both American and Mexican. The study found that 57% have crossed the border, 71% speak both Spanish and English, and 77% have close relationships with people on the other side of the border. Preliminary findings were announced at Tijuana's Autonomous University of Baja California, which helped collect data. Most of these students, they are living a truly binational life. Their families are on both sides of the border. The students move back and forth across the border in a fluid way, but they happen to have a classroom that is on one side of the border. 
He says he hopes these findings will help policymakers think of Tijuana and San Diego students in a more holistic way to, be, to more efficiently support a binational workforce. Researchers say the students appear to face common problems. Almost all of the students surveyed want to go to college, but less than three in four of them believe they'll actually earn a college degree. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Scientists have a long way to go in developing an effective Zika drug. Researchers at UC San Diego are taking the first step, and KPBS science reporter David Wagner says they need your help. UC San Diego's Jair Siqueira Neto is originally from Brazil. He says Zika is already affecting friends and family back home. My father, for instance, he had uh, Zika, uh, so it's, it's really common. Yet there aren't any drugs to fight the virus. The race is on to develop effective treatments for Zika, and Siqueira Neto plans to test tens of thousands of potential treatments using this drug screening robot. <laughs> But first, he'll need to identify which chemical compounds to study. To do that, he's joining forces with researchers in Brazil and the U.S. to use a virtual drug screening platform hosted by IBM called OpenZika. It's a process that's going to take a lot of computing power. Siqueira Neto says anyone can help by donating unused computational power from their computers or Android smartphones. And they would have to download a software uh, for their computer or an app for their Android phones and simply say uh, whenever uh, the processor is not working for things that I need, it will be used to do the calculations for the project. Developing a drug for Zika could take 10 years or more. But Siqueira Neto says if enough people pitch in at this early stage in the process, scientists could find effective Zika drugs sooner rather than later. David Wagner, KPBS News. To find out more, go to worldcommunitygrid.org. Sharp Grossmont Hospital is now under fire from doctors and patients for secretly recording videos of women's surgeries. It was trying to see who was stealing medications, but now the hospital has apologized for a breach of patient privacy. Reporter Cheryl Clark with our media partner, iNewsource, brings us this update. Cheryl, what was the breach in privacy? Well, that's right, Susan. Sharp now has a bit of egg on its face. An attorney representing a doctor whom Sharp said is seen in those videos putting vials of drugs in his pocket told me that the hospital has made a big mistake. As part of the discovery process to defend the doctor, this attorney received video clips from Sharp. There were just supposed to be 12 video clips, and none of them were supposed to show any patients. But when the attorney opened Sharp's thumb drive, he was quite surprised. Those files contain not 12 videos, but 77, and he said many of them showed identifiable patients undergoing surgery. It acknowledged 14 of those video clips actually show patients. Now Sharp is formally apologizing for the breach and said it is contacting every patient who's in them. Are there other ramifications or penalties for this mistake? Well, there could be. State health officials said they've started an investigation, and they told me a hospital could be fined $25,000 for each patient breach, up to a max of 250000 What other reactions are you getting to this story? Well, some doctors are speaking out, saying they're very upset Sharp ever resorted to secret video surveillance. One former chief of anesthesiology, Dr. Patrick Sullivan, issued an open letter to the public saying the community should be outraged. And also, Sullivan and another doctor told me lots of sharp doctors took drugs like propofol from the Women's Center because they were nationally in short supply. Alternatives just don't work as well on patients. I knew source reporter Cheryl Clark. Thank you. California voters in November could be faced with two death penalty ballot measures. One would speed up executions, the other would do away with them entirely. A group of death penalty supporters today submitted 590,000 signatures in San Diego and across the state for an initiative to streamline executions. The measure would expand the pool of defense attorneys so death penalty appeals could proceed quickly. It would also appoint a lawyer to a defendant at the time of a sentence rather than waiting years. Supporters say the initiative will help keep Californians safe and ensure justice for murder victims and their families, including slain police officers.
43 police officers in California were killed by criminals currently serving in death row. When a criminal kills a police officer, they do more than just take the life of a hero. They strike a blow against the civil society itself by striking down someone we put out there to protect us all. A group opposed to the death penalty appears to have also gathered enough signatures on a measure to repeal capital punishment altogether and replace death sentences with life in prison. San Diego professional golfer Phil Mickelson's finances are not quite up to par following investigations connecting him to insider trading. The golfer must repay nearly $1 million he gained for trading Dean Foods Company stock in 2012. Investigators say Mickelson was allegedly urged by a gambler to whom he owed money. Mickelson was okay. named a relief we defendant, meaning he will not face criminal charges, but he must return the amount. And that's the message that we're trying to send today, that when you make profits that you're not entitled to, we're going to take those profits back, and that we bring charges based on the evidence and the law that we can bring. The Securities and Exchange Commission says Mickelson has agreed to return the money. Public bathrooms are a hot-button issue in Oceanside. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John explains the challenge for city leaders and the people who need a place to sleep. Oceanside Pier is always a popular place to hang out for fishermen, surfers, tourists, residents and the homeless. The city has recently invested about $2 million in new public bathrooms at the beach and upgraded the bathrooms on the pier. So this is one of Oceanside's new pier bathrooms and it has a door that locks just a small space inside but it turns out that this space is quite a warm, secure space for people who are homeless. Oceanside City Councilman Chuck Lowry says he first became aware last summer that about 25 homeless were locking themselves in beach bathrooms every night. When our new restrooms were under construction, we had a lot of portable rental toilets out on the beach, and I had no idea that was happening. And after, after about a month of hearing it every day that this is happening, it became just kind of like, wow, another not good situation. The city locks up its new beach bathrooms from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. every night. I spoke with this group of homeless folk who did not want to be interviewed, but they told me they've had their belongings stolen so often that they sometimes take refuge in public bathrooms where they can lock the door. They sometimes come back at 4 a.m. when the bathrooms open in order to shelter somewhere warm and safe for just a few hours. Lowry says the problem has overflowed, as it were, onto the pier, especially overnight. We have uh, found that people are locking themselves into the restrooms here on the pier, and then what happens is other people who want to use those restrooms wind up urinating or defecating right here on, on the pier out in the open. The city council has rejected the idea of closing the pier overnight and is working on collaborating with the restaurant at the end of the pier for tighter security. So we have some options if you have issues with meds. Yeah. Officer Lonnie Harper is one of two police officers on Oceanside's Homeless Outreach, or HOT team. He works to connect the homeless with services, but he says that can take a while for those with mental health or drug issues. So in 18 months, my partner and I have been able to get about 30 people, probably give or take a couple, off the street. Harper says Oceanside is investing in services to get the homeless housed, but with vacancy rates at an all-time low and rents at an all-time high, some people are still surviving outdoors and finding shelter wherever they can, even if it's only a bathroom stall. Allison St. John, KPBS News. The National Weather Service has issued a wind advisory for parts of San Diego County. Steph Davis has more tonight on the KPBS Weather Report. A bit damp and cloudy across the area as we roll throughout our Thursday. You can see the clouds building in across the west here on our satellite and radar. Off to the north, some showers breaking out, more in the way of just some mist and sprinkles across Southern California. So as I mentioned, just kind of a damp and cloudy day. Satellite and radar, though, remaining fairly tranquil. We don't expect any kind of widespread precipitation as we roll throughout tonight, but we could see some of those 
those low clouds return as we head into the nighttime hours. Borrego Springs will fall back to 61 degrees. Those low clouds will build into Mount Laguna as temperatures tumble back to 42. Upper 50s or low 50s in Ramona and Alpine tonight. 59 with clouds building into Oceanside and low clouds forming in San Diego with your overnight low at 62 degrees. Now we are going to see an increase in winds as we head over the next couple of days to so the National Weather Service has issued a wind advisory in effect from Friday throughout your Saturday morning because some of these wind gusts could reach up to 60 miles per hour. Now the wind advisory not for San Diego itself but for the surrounding mountains and in the desert. So do watch for blowing and drifting dust and if you drive a high profile vehicle you'll definitely want to exercise caution as we head towards the weekend. Here's a look at your five day outlook along the coast. We'll see clouds building in as we head throughout the day on Friday. You'll notice 67 as your daytime high clouds with the passing shower or two for your Saturday with highs near 70. Low clouds break for some sunshine Sunday and Monday at the coast with highs in the upper 60s. 68 is your high for your Tuesday. Five day outlook inland. Low clouds building in for your Friday. Could see some peaks of sun, high 67 degrees. Low clouds break for sun Saturday and Sunday with highs at 68. We'll climb near 70 on Monday, and then the similar weather pattern continues into the day on Tuesday. Five day outlook for the mountains. Show those gusty winds for your Friday. Again, we have that wind advisory in effect throughout the day on Friday into your Saturday morning. Temperatures will cool off significantly. Saturday as highs struggle to break out of the 50s. 58 on Sunday, 59 on Monday. Same deal for the day on Tuesday. Your five day outlook for the deserts again showing those gusty winds for your Friday. Watch for blowing and drifting sand and dust. Sunlit and pleasant for your Saturday. And then temperatures will climb as we look ahead to next week with daytime highs back into the mid 80s. Steph Davis, KPBS News. An invasive species is taking advantage of warmer waters at Crater Lake in Oregon. Earthfix producer Jess Burns shows us the native creatures who are at risk. Biologist Mark Buktenica is scouring the shoreline of Crater Lake. Flying ants, lizards, and small toads are everywhere. Aren't they cute? But the critter he's looking for is much more elusive. Then his persistence pays off. This is the Mazama Newt. Mazama Newt from no place else in the world. Crater Lake formed nearly 8,000 years ago after Mount Mazama erupted and the caldera began filling with rainwater. We don't know when newts entered the caldera, but sometime thousands of years ago. There were no fish or other predators in the newly formed lake, and the Mazama newt expanded and thrived. It's playing dead on us now. It was the undisputed top of the food chain, but not anymore. Because crawling beneath the surface of the lake, a new champion has emerged, the signal crayfish. Their story begins more than 100 years ago, back when getting to Crater Lake from Medford took five days by horse and wagon. To attract visitors, early conservationists began stocking the lake with game fish like trout and salmon. Craig Ackerman is park superintendent. In the past, the national parks have done many things which people thought were good ideas at the time that turned out to be not so great ideas. In 1915, park managers introduced the signal crayfish to feed those fish. And that turned out to be a worse decision than stocking the fish in the first place because the crayfish have become out of control. And this is obvious out in the lake. Scientists at the park are finding that crayfish and the Mazama newts don't really get along. They have a standoff. What's going to happen? Not only do they compete for the same food, but studies done by park biologists show crayfish chase and harass the newts, <gasps> causing them to flee. They almost look like a pack hunting a little. And in some cases, much worse. 
they're virtually the perfect invader. And the Zama Newt, on the other hand, is an ideal prey. After thousands of years evolving without predators, the newt lost its best weapon, a potent neurotoxin that can kill. With the loss of its toxicity, it's left virtually defenseless. But actually, crayfish in Crater Lake weren't thought to be such a problem until relatively recently. Surveying started in 2008, and scientists found newts had the advantage, occupying about half the shoreline. The crayfish had most of the rest. By 2014, the crayfish had taken over 75% of the shallows. It's right here, Scott. And that's not all, says biologist John Umick. Got it. Big bags for this one. Oh crayfish are impacting all the organisms in the near shore, not only newts. In crayfish areas, we don't find snails. You have to go outside of the crayfish dominated areas to even find a snail or two. Instead of this great biodiversity area, it's down to one or two organisms, and that's it, besides crayfish. Without these tiny organisms eating the algae, the crystal blue clarity of Crater Lake could be at risk. Crater Lake biologist Scott Gerdner suspects that climate change is playing a role. In a. The surface temperature of the lake has increased about three degrees in the past 10 to 15 years. And it may just allow the crayfish to move faster. They just are more active at, at warmer waters and it may allow them to have more success at reproduction so that their numbers have increased faster now. The team surveys for crayfish each summer. Surface, oh my gosh, that's a lot of crayfish. They set traps all along the shore and deep into the lake. Six. They count, weigh, and measure their catch. 38.55. And they tag and release some to find out how they travel. Yep. They've even found crayfish at 750 feet. I'll be Look outside. at that. It's amazing. <laughs> Deepest known crayfish in any lake system. What are they doing at 250 meters? Scientists expect that if crayfish continue to spread, it's very possible that the, that the Mazama newt would be eliminated from the lake if we didn't do anything. But at this point, no one knows exactly what to do. Trapping, even intensive trapping, hasn't made a dent. Yet there are a few glimmers of hope for the Mazama Newt. There's the possibility of building underwater barriers or fences to slow crayfish expansion. Another solution could be provided by the lake itself. Spring-fed pools like this emerge when avalanches pile up rock berms along the shore. These pools are newt nurseries. I'll come into the pools while there's still snow on the edges of the pool. The conservation promise is that while newts move across land to get to the isolated pools, signal crayfish do not. If other strategies to stop the spread of the crayfish aren't effective, these pools could become a final stronghold for the Mazama newt and other native animals. We have the opportunity right now to at least slow down the invasion of crayfish. If we miss this opportunity, I think it's going to be a lot of trouble for the newts. Without intervention, this unique creature could vanish from the lake within the next few decades. Controlling the signal crayfish and protecting this unique ecosystem will be labor intensive and expensive. But the Park Service's mission and mandate is to do this above all else. So we will put the resources into this that we uh, feel necessary. The sobering reality is crayfish will likely never be eliminated from Crater Lake. Come on now, guy. And maybe the best the National Park can hope to do is carve out a few safe havens for the Mazama Newt. This Earth Fix reporting project was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. A veteran journalist who spent nearly five decades with 60 Minutes died today. Morley Safer was equally at home reporting on social injustices, abstract art, and wartime atrocities. He announced his retirement last week. Safer was 84 years old. Robots on Mars. It sounds like the title of a 1950s sci-fi picture, but it's actually a real goal for NASA. AP reporter David Martin says robots now may be pioneers on the red planet. Meet Val, NASA's Iron Man. 
Standing six feet tall and weighing in at 300 pounds, the space agency hopes this humanoid robot can lay the groundwork for a mission once thought impossible. NASA someday intends to send a robot just like this, or maybe a descendant of this robot, off to Mars to set up habitats before the astronauts come. Val is one of four sister robots in NASA's Valkyrie project. Three are currently on loan to universities. The University of Massachusetts Lowell and Northeastern University are trying to work out some of the robot's kinks. Because while Val might look like a superhero, its mighty powers fall short, even with its $2 million price tag. So Valkyrie, as you can see, even just having balance on a very solid, stable surface is having trouble right now. But eventually, we want her to be able to walk on more soft surfaces like this, because that's, that's really what she's going to experience on Mars. NASA sees the Valkyrie project as a key to its goal of a human mission to Mars by 2035. Since robots will be the first ones to colonize Mars, basically, uh, they will work next to astronauts to carry out the exploration missions um, on Mars and even beyond. But first, the robots will need to hone their skills on Earth. David Martin, The Associated Press. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.